an entertainment pullout from the Seattle uh, Sun. Uh, which no yeah, there's a lot of us who still miss the rocket. Yeah, yeah. That was a great, that was a great zine. Right. And I look around here, I can see a lot of groups that we, <laughs> the reason that the rocket started was um, punk rock had started up uh, in the late 70s, as you obviously know, uh, and it wasn't being covered. There was no outlet in Seattle that understood it. Like, uh, Seattle Times didn't cover it because they didn't understand it. And the, usually you have an alternative weekly, like Willamette Week or some of the other ones, and that they have an attitude sort of like what the Stranger and the Weekly have now. But in those days, in the late 70s, the Seattle Weekly was very much a kind of wine and cheese, and they wrote about, uh, you know, chamber music in the symphony. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not kidding. Yeah, that's actually. all good stuff. But yeah, I'm not, yeah, sure, it completely is. Completely ignoring this but other sector. There was an entire uh, realm of music that I was really interested in, and a lot of other people, a lot of my friends were really interested in, and there was no outlet. There was nothing. It wasn't being covered. And I'm talking about, these are the days when The Clash or Elvis, Elvis Costello did his first co uh, concert in the United States in Seattle. And, and it was very frequent that these British bands would have their very first American concert in Seattle because they'd fly over on the polar route. They'd play Seattle just to sort of warm up before they'd hit LA and New York so they could kind of, you know, get... Work their way across the nation. Yeah, exactly. But we home. often were the very first stop. Elvis Costello, The Clash, you know, uh, even Madonna, of all people, you know, <laughs> even though she's obviously not, uh, although she talks like it now, she actually is not from, uh, from England. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. So there's this, this huge, rich, vibrant music scene, and uh, nobody was covering it, so uh, a bunch of people from the Sun started the, the rocket, and that's, and, and that's, what it, that's why it came about. There was, there was no other place in the country that had a magazine that was just specifically devoted to music, a local, a local magazine. Right. You know, I mean, every other place, uh, either somebody on the main, the, you know, the main paper or the alternative weekly was hip enough to understand what was going on. That wasn't the case in Seattle. So. Yeah, because, I mean, the rocket became the Bible for those of us who were, I was living in West Seattle at the time. We looked forward to it coming out because it was the only thing telling us, really, unless you happen to be listening at the right moment on the radio station, who was coming to town, right, yeah. where they were playing, where there were good places to go to. Right. Um, because unless it was happening in your neighborhood and you saw it on, there was no internet. Yes, that's yeah. right. It was, yeah, it was a very unique, very unique publication. And uh, I was really happy to be part of it. And um, one day a telephone call came in and they were starting a show over at uh, King uh, that was called Rev, which stood for Rock. Entertainment video, REV, <laughs> and uh, they wanted somebody to. Uh, what they wanted was Johnny Brenton, which I wrote. I wrote that column. I was Johnny Brenton. They right. wanted him to come out, and they wanted a, they wanted a music news segment, and kind of like a Kurt Loder thing. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly like that. And except that MTV, MTV local, except MTV didn't exist then. No, so, yeah. so they wouldn't Pretty know. Good. They wouldn't know to say. Right. Like, hey, we Kurt want a Kurt Loder, Loder thing. So this was before. MTV. So you pioneered Kurt Loder. Well, it's the, <laughs> when we did this show, uh, they wanted a, a local mute, and I called it the Rocket Report, and that, and I was on that, and uh, it was very popular because MTV hadn't come into town yet. This is all, all these music videos, and so I was on that, and I was doing kind of funny stuff with my segment. And the program director said, you know, you'd be, you might be really good for this new show, which was a comedy show, which eventually, you know, became almost live. So it was just this random phone call when I was working at this newspaper that's now defunct that got me into television. Yeah, and there were a lot of amazing uh, local writers and uh, music people who were involved in the Rocket. Yes. Uh, Charles Cross and all those. A very good friend of mine. Yeah, amazing, amazing talent. Uh, who at the time we were just reading, they were just, it was just a name, you know, on the article who have all since become legendary. So there was a lot of talent. Linda Berry, the cartoonist. Right. Uh, Matt Groening from The Simpsons did some of his first work. He was at Evergreen. Yeah, he was still going to Evergreen. 
uh, and a lot of the people that were the photography and art director staff did very, very well. They went to New York. There was at one point where most of the major, there, there, a, a story was done in New York Magazine about how the, this magazine in Seattle called The Rocket was like the farm team for New York art directors. That There, there was a certain <laughs> point where Vanity Fair, uh, Rolling Stone, The Village Voice, Newsweek, and I forget, uh, oh, and Mademoiselle were all Recruiting. The, all, no, all the art directors had come through this one magazine in Seattle. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And they that kind of ran the New York uh, art direction scene. Back where they're, you know, we're supposed to have, you know, don't they still have dirt roads back there in Seattle? You know? Well, it was the, like the that. Northeasters, you know. Yeah, and it, it was also, um, at that time, um, it was just sort of gospel that you had to, in order to become successful, you had to leave Seattle. Seattle, yeah. Uh, and when we were on doing Almost Live, right when the grunge scene started to take off is when, just coincidentally, it's when we decided to take the show out and see if we could get a national deal. And I know that that had something to do with it, that everybody was looking at Seattle at the time. And, and a lot of the promotion on when we ended up on Comedy Central had to do with, you know, take a look at the show that Seattle's been laughing at for years. You know, like <laughs> Seattle was this big... You know, it, it had a lot of cachet. All of a sudden, you didn't have to leave Seattle to be successful. They were coming here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on your website, and everybody, uh, check out John Keister's website. It's almostjohnkeister.com. Yes. Great website, a lot of information. There's, a, there's uh, something that you wrote that I found interesting about your time uh, at The Rocket. You said, I quickly learned that if you love somebody's music, you never wanted to meet them in person. Yes. If you did, you could never listen to that music again without visions of them or their handlers screaming at you and throwing something <laughs> at you running through your head. Yes, that's, that's where, correct. Where did that, who, who, where, how did that all come about? Well, it first happened by surprise, uh, you know, because I thought one of the cool things about uh, you know, being in this newspaper would be that I'd get to meet my idols. But then, after a while, I'll just tell you, just quick, I'll, I'll tell you how it happened. But, but real uh, specifically, um, Elvis Costello didn't come through Seattle for 13 years after I originally saw him in 1978, and it was 13. I think I, I'm correct about that. He would either hit Portland or Vancouver, mm -hmm. and I had gotten older and wiser in that time. Uh, and uh, I was actually was it, well, the next time he came back was that when he did the Rising Star? Uh, he he did the Rising Star. Uh, actually, he did it. Tw he 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 came here twice. He did he did the Rising Star, which yeah. were an amazing series. Yeah, that was amazing. Be like, uh, oh, uh, uh, Talking Heads uh, opening for Blonde. You know, what I mean, it'd be yeah, like, and it was you know, super cheap too. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, two dollars. It was like two dollars. Yeah. So yeah, it was like a buck ninety nine, two yeah. bucks or whatever. Yeah, I have this. These amazing ticket so stubs that it was like you know the Clash two dollars you know <laughs> like an opening band Pat Benatar XTC you know yeah. and yeah and uh, uh, so uh, I was actually offered the opportunity to uh, because the people there said, oh John you know when I, I had uh, seats up close to the you know to the stage because I really wanted it was very important to me to see him again and they said would you like to come backstage and meet him and I said no. No, I really don't want to. No. And I turned it down because I never wanted to have the experience that I had with these other groups. And, and the worst one was, and I really enjoyed their music, but they, again, didn't come through town very often, the Pretenders, because mm. they would, uh, they were on their way and then one of them died. You know? mm -hmm. And then right. they were on their way again and another one of them died. And then they were on their way and their drummer put his hand through a window. You know, and it was like, you know, whatever. <laughs> So they, when they finally, the rock band. yeah, they finally get. By the time they finally got to town, uh, we had a very, very good relationship with Warner Brothers, which was their record label. And uh, so I called, uh, and I had. Th this the Rocket had been around long enough that um, people were very. We would help a lot of record labels out with these acts that they had that were very difficult to break because the, the mainstream newspapers would go, the Go Go's, what, the Who, the what, we don't know, no, and they and we would do articles because we had people in those genres who, who would say we need to do an article on these guys because they are going to be huge a year right. from now, and, right. and and in most cases those people then a year later would really remember that, and in particular like somebody like Def Leppard who. 
when uh, I was told by our heavy metal specialist, Jeff Gilbert, uh, I know everybody knows Gilbert, right? You know, I was told, he said, these, we need to do a big story on these guys because in a year from now, these are going to be the most famous, this is going to be the biggest band in the world. He said, I guarantee you this will be the biggest. And I was like, okay. And so we did, and then when they came back through Seattle uh, a year later, he was right, and they came to us and said, whatever you want, you know, anything you want. And they, you know, did all these great photo sessions and wore the rocket t-shirts on stage and, you know, oh, all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 All right, so, so we had a really good relationship with the record labels because of stuff like that, because we'd help them out with stuff <coughs> that they needed help on. And then you'd get rewarded after that. And so I, we'd really like to get some uh, photos of uh, Chrissy Hine and the Pretenders in concert. Not a problem. Uh, we got to, so I go backstage and the, uh, the tour manager is like, oh, you're the guys from The Rocket. You know, here's your laminate, here's this, where's your photographer? Right here. And it's one of the, one of the best, this is, again, a real famous photographer, Rex Rystad, who came out. And, Done a million. I mean, you've seen he did the everybody's appreciate. seen his stuff. Yeah, yeah, everyone. Yeah, and so um, and Rex always was. Uh, he was the guy that you, if there was any sort of iffy situation, Rex could, he would never even needed a pass. He could usually talk his way into it, and I mean, and uh, you know, he, he could handle pretty much any situation. But this time it was like, well, there's no problem. And so the the uh, manager says, the only thing is you just. You, just for the first two songs, and that's really the only requirement. We're like, absolutely, you know, that, that's, that's plenty of time. So uh, there's Rex with all his official stuff, and he goes out, and I go to the kind of back of the of the hall. I'm just watching, and here come the pretenders, and they take the stage, and uh, and after the first song, I see Chrissy Hine, like I see her motioning, like, and I'm like, looks like. Wow, it looks like she's yelling it around. I wonder what that's about. You know? <laughs> if I didn't know better, I would think she was angry. At Rex. And then by the second song, you see these bouncers coming in and grabbing Rex and pulling him off. And so I go backstage, and uh, what's going on? And she's back. She's in a rampage. She's, you know, I don't know what kind of language we can use you on could, this one. We are not FCC regulated. You can say whatever you want. Fucking ass. She's like, get the, f you know, who the, f yeah. who are you? And we're like, no, no, we have it all. You know, so get the, f you know, and I was like, oh my God, you know, so. She just, huh? no, she didn't get it. <laughs> and I called, so I called the guy at Warner Brothers and he's like, I'm sorry, you know, uh, when she's nice, she can be really nice, but when she's not, she's the worst, you know. Wow. And, you know, and I heard that, but I was like, I can never listen to, you know, that the same music way, anymore. Yeah, right. And I was like, oh God, you know, just having to like, try to like, let's just get out of here without, you know, people getting killed. You know? <laughs>